Hello and welcome my Cozy Couch Potatoes. This is Spice Rack Studios, the Cozy Couch. And today we're continuing with The City of Ember, Chapter 16, The Singing. Uh, last chapter, as I thought, the guards were coming after Lena and Dune for spreading, I don't know what this was, for spreading vicious rumors. I already knew that there was going to be... It was too weird with the guards. I knew there was something up. It was too weird. So, Lena and Dune decided that they're going to go ahead and take a boat out of Ember. And it ended with Lena taking a message to Clary about what they're going to do, but then she almost ran into guards, and so she, now she's running. That's where we ended. We have... Five, including this one today, we have five chapters left before we finish The City of Ember. And I'm super excited to finish this. It was getting really good, so let's dive in to chapter 16. Chapter 16, The Singing. When Lena heard the guards shout, terror shot through her. She ran faster than she had ever run before, her heart pounding wildly. Behind her, the guards kept up their shouting, and she knew that if other guards were nearby, that they would come running. Nearby, they would come running. She had to find a hiding place. Ahead of her was Bill Bolio's square. Was there a shot she could duck into it? And like an answer, Dune's words came back to her. The library. It's almost always open, even on holidays. She didn't have time to think. She didn't ask herself whether Ed whether Edward Pocket would be willing to hide her, or whether there would be or whether there would even be a good place to hide in the library. She just ran for the passageway that led to the library door and darted down it. But the library door wouldn't open. She turned the knob frantically. She pulled and pushed and then at the same time and then at the same time that she heard the running footsteps. Of the guards coming into the square, she saw the small handwritten sign stuck to the door, closed for the singing. The guards were very near now. If she ran, they would see her. She flattened herself against the wall, hoping they wouldn't think to look in the library passage. In the library passage. But they did. Here she is, yelled one of the guards. She tried to shoot past him, but the passage was too narrow, and he caught her by the arm. She pulled and twisted and kicked. But the chief guard had her now, had her now too. He gripped her other arm with fingers that felt like iron. Stop your struggling, he shouted. Lena reached up and grabbed a handful of his, of his wiry beard. She pulled with all her might and the chief guard roared, but he didn't let go. He yanked her forward, almost off the ground, and the two guards dragged her across the square at an awkward lopsided pace that made her stumble that made her stumble over her own feet. You're hurting me. You're hurting me, Lena said. Don't hold so tight. Don't you tell us what to do, said the chief guard. We'll hold you tight till we get you where we're, where you're going. Where's that, said Lena. She was so enraged at her bad luck that she almost forgot to be afraid. You're going to see the mayor, missy, said the chief guard. He'll decide what to do with you. But I haven't done anything wrong, spreading, vici spreading vicious rumors, said the guard, telling dangerous lies calculated to cause civic unrest. It's not a lie, she said, but the guard gripped her arm even more tightly and gave her a shove, so she stumbled sideways. No talking, he said, and they walked the rest of the way in grim silence. A few people had already gathered in Harkin Square through the workers, Though the workers were still getting it ready for the singing, street sweepers crossed the square back and forth, pushing their brooms. Someone appeared at a second-floor window of a building on Gilly Street and unfurled one of the banners that was always displayed for the singing. A long piece of red cloth, faded after years of use, but still showing its design of wavy lines, representing the river, the source of all power. That was for the song of the river. There would be a banner on the 
There would be a banner on the broad street side of the square, too. This one deep yellow gold with a design like a grid to represent the song of the city. And another banner on the up. Uh, and another banner on the Otterwell side for this song of darkness, perfectly black except for a narrow yellow edge. The guards, the guards marched Lena up the steps, up the steps of the gathering hall and through the wide doorway. They took her down the main corridor, op opened the door at the end, and gave her one last push, a push that caused her to stagger forward in an undignified way and bump up against the back of a chair. It was the same room she'd been in that other, much happier day, her first day as a messenger. Nothing had changed. The frayed red curtains, the armchairs, the armchairs with the upholstery worn thin, the hideous mud-colored carpet, the portraits on the wall looked down at her sorrowfully. Sit there, said the chief guard. He pointed at a small, hard-looking chair that faced the large armchair. Lena sat. Next to the chair was the small table she remembered from before, with the china teapot and a tray of china teacups with chips around their edges. The chief guard left the room to find the mayor, Lena supposed. The other one stood silently with his arms folded across his chest. Nothing happened for a while. Lena tried to think about what she would say to the mayor, but her mind wouldn't work. Then the door to the front hall opened and the mayor came in. It was the first time Lena had seen him up close since she had delivered Looper's message to him. He seemed even more immense. His baggy face was the color of a mushroom. He wore a black suit that stretched only far enough across his vast belly for one button to connect with his buttonhole. He moved ponderously across the room and, settle, and settled into the armchair, filling it completely. Next to his chair was a table, and on the table was a brass bell the size of, the size of a fist. The mayor gazed for a moment at Lena with eyes that looked like the openings of tunnels, and then he turned to the guard. Dismissed, he said. Dismissed, he said, waving the back of his hand at him. Return when I ring the bell. The guard left. The mayor swung his gaze back to Lena. I am not surprised, he said. L he said. He lifted one arm and pointed a finger at Lena's face. I already knew I didn't like him, but pointing his finger in her face just makes me like... Bleh. You have been in trouble before, going where you shouldn't. Lena, start Lena started to speak, but the mayor held up his hand. It was an oddly small hand. It was an oddly small hand with, fi with short fingers like ripe pea pods. Curiosity, said the mayor. A dangerous quality, unhealthy, especially regrettable in one so young. I'm twelve, said Lena. Silence, said the mayor. I am speaking. I do not like this mayor. He has too much power in his head. He, he wriggled slightly from side to side, wedging himself more firmly into the chair. He'll need to be pried out of it, Lena thought. Ember, as you know, the mayor went on, is in a time of difficulty. Extraordinary measures are, ne are necessary. This is a time when citizens should be most loyal, most law-abiding, for the good of all. Lena said nothing. She watched how the flesh under the mare's chin bulged in and out as he spoke, and then she turned her eyes from this unpleasant sight and looked carefully around the room. She was thinking now, calculating, but not about what the mare was saying. The duties of a mare, said the mare, are complex cannot be understood by regular citizens, particularly children. That is why he went on leaning slightly forward so that his stomach pushed farther out along his lap. Certain things must remain hidden from the public. The public would not understand. The public must have faith, said the mayor once again, holding up his hand, this time with a finger pointing to the ceiling. That is all. That all is being done for their benefit. For their own good. Hogwash, said Lena. The mare jerked backward. His eyebrows came down over his eyes, making them into dark slits 
What? he said. Surely I heard you incorrectly. Incorrectly. I said hogwash, said Lena. It means... Do not presume to tell me what it means, the mare cried. Impudence will make things worse for you. He was breathing heavily, and his words came out with spaces between them. A misguided child, such as yourself, requires a forceful lesson. His short fingers gripped the arms of his, gripped the arms of the chair. Perhaps, he said, your curiosity has led you to wonder. Perhaps, he said, your curiosity has led you to wonder about the prison room. What could it be like? Eh? Dark, cold, uncomfortable. He made the smile that Lena remembered from assignment day. His lips pulled away from his small teeth. His gray cheeks folded. You will have a chance to find out. You will become closely acquainted with the prison room. The guards will ex the guards will escort you there. Your accomplice, another known troublemaker, will join you as soon as he is located. The mayor turned to look for the bell. This was the moment when Lena had planned to make a dash for freedom. She thought she had a slim chance to succeed if she moved fast enough. But something happened in that instant that gave her a head that gave her a head start. The lights went out. There was no flicker this time, just sudden, complete darkness. It was fortunate that Lena had already planned her move and knew exactly which way to go. She leapt up, knocking over her chair with her arm. With her arm, she made a wide swipe and knocked over the table next to the chair as well. The furniture thumping to the floor, the teapot shattered, and the mare's enraged shouts made a clamor that covered the sound of her footsteps as she dashed to the stairway door. Was it unlocked? She reached for the knob. Grunts and squeaks told her that the mare was struggling to rise from his chair. She turned the knob and pulled, and the door sprang open. She closed the door behind her and leapt upward. And leapt upward two steps at a time. Even in the pitch dark, she could climb stairs. In the room, the bell, the bell clanged and clanged, and the mare bellowed. When she got to the first landing, she heard. She heard the guards shouting. There was a crash. Someone must have fallen over the toppled chair. Someone must have fallen over the toppled chair or table. Where is she? Someone yelled. Must have run out the door. Did they know which door? She didn't hear footsteps behind her. If she could make it to the roof, and if from the roof she could jump to the roof of the prison room, and from there to the street, then maybe she could escape. Her lungs were on fire now, her breath was burning her throat, but she climbed without stopping, and when she came to the top, she burst she burst through the door to the roof and ran out. And that was when the lights came back on. It was, if, it was as if the blackout had been arranged especially for her. I'm so lucky, she thought, so extremely lucky. Ahead of her was the clock tower. She went around to the other side of it. No dancing on the roof this time. A low wall ran along the edge of the building. Lena approached it cautiously and peered out over the swarm of people assembling in Harkin Square. Directly below her was the entrance of the gathering hall, and as she watched, two guards dash dashed out of the door and down the steps. Good, they had gone the wrong way. They must think she escaped into the crowd. For the moment she was safe. The clock in the tower began to chime. Three great booms rang out. It was time for the singing to begin. Lena gazed down at the people of Ember. Gathered to sing their song. They stood so close together that she could see only their faces, which were lifted up toward the sky, with the hard, bright lights shining down on them. They were silent, waiting for the songmaster to appear on the gathering hall steps. There was a strange hush, as if, as if the city were holding its breath. Of the whole ember year, Lena thought this this hush before the singing was one of the most exciting moments. She remembered other years when she had stood with her parents too short to see the song to see the songmaster's signal signal too short to see anything but people's backs and legs and waited for the first note to thunder out. 
She felt her heart move at that moment every year. The sound would rise in waves around her like water, almost as if it could lift her off the ground. Now suddenly the moment came again. From hundreds of voices rose the first notes of of the song of the city, deep and strong. She felt as if She felt as she had all the years before, a quivering inside, as though a string under her ribs had been plucked, and a rush of joy and sadness mixed together. The deep, rumbling chords of the song filled Harkin Square. Lena felt that she might step off the edge of the building and walk across the air. It seemed so solid with sound. The song of the city was long. There were were verses about streets of light, in walls of stone, about citizens with sturdy hearts, about stored abun- about stored abundance never ending. Not true, Lena thought, but at last but at last the song of the city wound down to its end. The singers held the final note, which grew softer and softer, and then there was silence again. Lena looked out at the li- Lena looked out at the lighted streets spreading away in every direction the streets she knew so well she loved her city worn out and crumbling though it was she looked up at the clock ten minutes after three june would be getting ready to leave before the pipe works she didn't know whether he'd seen her being captured if he had he would he would be wondering if she'd been locked into the prison room he'd be wondering if she he'd be wondering if he should try to rescue her or if he should go down and or if she or if he should go down the river by himself she should be hurrying to join him but a sadness held her back like a heavy stone in her chest she bent her face into the palms of her hands and pressed hard against her closed eyes how could she go away from ember and leave poppy behind because if she went she must leave poppy behind mustn't she how could she take her on a journey of such danger the song of the river startled her when it began the men's voices low and rolling swelling with power and then the women's voices coming in above with a complicated melody that seemed to fight the current lena listened unable to move the song of the river made her uneasy it always had with its rolling relentless rhythm it seemed to urge her onward saying go down go away go now The more she listened, the more she felt something like the motion of the river in her stomach, a churning, sickening feeling. Then came the song of darkness, the last of the three songs, and the one most filled with longing and and majesty. The soul of Ember was in this song. Its tremendous chords held all the sorrow and all the strength of the people of the city. The song reached its climax, darkness like an endless night, sang the hunger sang the hundreds of voices so powerfully the air seemed to shiver and at that moment the lights once more went out the voices faltered but only for an instant then they rose again in the darkness stronger even than before lena sang too she stood up and sang with all her might into the deep solid blackness the last notes echoed and faded into a terrible silence lena stood utterly still will it end like this she thought at the finish of the last song she felt the cold stone of the clock tower behind her back she waited then an idea came to her that made her skin prickle what if she were to shout into the silence right now what if she were to say listen people we found the way out of ember it's the river we go in the river she could announce the astounding news just as she and dune had planned to do and then and then what would happen would the guards rush to the would the guards rush to the roof and seize her would the people in the square would the people in the square think her news was just a child's wishful thinking or would they listen and be saved she could feel the words pushing upward in her throat she wanted so much to say them she took a deep breath and leaned forward but before she could speak a rumble a rumble of voices arose arose below someone shouted don't move and someone else shrieked the rumble rose to a roar 
and then cries flew into the darkness from everywhere. The crowd was erupting into panic. There was no hope of being heard now. Lena clutched the edge of the clock tower as if as if the as if the tumult below might cause her to fall. She strained her eyes against the darkness. Without light, she could go nowhere. Lights, come back on, she prayed. Come back on. Then she saw something. At first, she thought her eyes were tricking her. She closed them tightly and opened them again. It was still there, a tiny point of light, moving. As she watched, it moved along slowly in a straight line. Then it turned and moved in a straight line again. Was it on River Road? She couldn't tell, but suddenly she knew what it was. It was Dune. It was Dune with a candle. Dune going toward the pipework. Pipeworks in the dark. And she wanted to go, too. She could feel it all through her. The urge to run and meet him and find the way out of Ember. To the new place. She listened to the shouts and wall and wails of the terrified people in the square below. She thought of Mrs. Murdo down there in the dark, being bumped and pushed with her arms wrapped tightly around Poppy, trying to protect her, and all at once everything seemed clear. Lena knew what she, had w Lena knew what she would do. If only the lights would come back on. If only this was not the very last blackout in the history of Ember. Watching the tiny light following its steady course, she made a wish with the whole force of her with the whole force of her heart and mind. Then the floodlights flickered. There was a great cry of hope from the crowd, and the lights came on and stayed on. Lena ran to the back edge of the roof, dropped easily down onto the roof of the prison room, and seeing no guards in the crowd that was now streaming into the street, she jumped from, from there to the ground and joined the throng of people. She made her way down Greystone, Greystone Street, going going at the same pace as everyone else so she wouldn't stand out. When she came to the trash can enclosure behind the gathering hall, she squatted down and hid. Her heart was beating fast, but she felt strong and purposeful now. She had her plan. As soon as she spotted Mrs. Murdo and Poppy on their way home, she'd put it into action. All right, my cozy couch potatoes, that is it for chapter 16. I hope you enjoyed that chapter as much as I did, and I hope to see you next time. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and whatever else you'd like to do. Have a good one. Bye.